so we're going to talk now about special matrices. This section is a collection of uh, small topics uh, relating to uh, matrices and matrix operations that we've talked about uh, so far. So we're going to talk about first uh, this thing called a diagonal matrix. Uh, the definition is uh, pretty uh, straightforward. It's a matrix whose non-zero entries are only on the diagonal. In other words, it's a matrix where all of the off-diagonal entries are zero. Okay, uh, square matrices only, by the way. Okay, uh, so uh, so this is a diagonal matrix. Um, so interesting fact about diagonal matrices, and that is that if you have two diagonal matrices, the product of those two diagonal matrices is also diagonal. Okay, so uh, I'm going to walk you through an explanation of why this is true. Uh, here's uh, the uh, rough idea. And I'm going to go. This proof here is a uh, is very similar to another proof that we're going to do in a few minutes. I'll go into more detail in that other proof. Um, but uh, for this one, here's the idea. Um, here's our matrix A. Here's our matrix B. And here's our product matrix A B. So let's look at uh, a particular row. Let's say the kth row of our product, and let's uh, see what we can conclude about it. Now, how do we understand the rows of a product of two matrices? Well, the rows of the product, as you will recall, are linear combinations of the rows of the right matrix where you use the corresponding row of the left matrix as your coefficients. And by corresponding, I mean, since we're looking for the kth row of the product, we use the kth row of the left matrix for our coefficients. Okay, so said differently, this row that we're interested in is this linear combination of these rows. All right. So what? What does that tell us? Well, here's some really good news. Uh, if you look at these coefficients uh, here in this kth row uh, of this left matrix, let's keep in mind that left matrix is diagonal. So being a diagonal entry in that kth row, it is only the kth entry that is non-zero because it's diagonal. All the rest of these are, well, let's see those zeros don't show up very well. Uh, zero, 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 zero. All the rest of these entries here are zeros. So those terms in the linear combination go away. Right? So zero times that row, who cares? It, it's zero times it, so it goes away. Uh, likewise, this is zero times the second row, it disappears. Okay, so in fact, the only term that does not disappear is that one non-zero entry times uh, the corresponding row here in the right matrix. Now, don't forget, being as this is a diagonal matrix, we're in the kth row. It is the kth entry in that kth row that is on the diagonal, and therefore it is the kth entry in that kth row that is non-zero. Okay. Being as it is the kth entry, that means that it is the kth row of the right matrix that it's being multiplied by. So I can write down exactly a formula for this kth row of the product. That kth row of the product is that number times that row. Okay, now what can we say about this row? Well, this row, let's not forget, is the kth row. It's the kth row of this right matrix. And because it is the kth row, it is all zeros except for a non-zero entry in the kth position. And so therefore, this product is all zeros with the non-zero product of those two entries in the kth entry in that position, in that kth position, uh, the kth entry in that kth row. 
And so that means that this product is diagonal. This applies to all k of the rows, and therefore uh, the matrix is diagonal. Okay, so that's the big idea uh, of the argument. All right, moving along. So here's the related uh, fact. Kind of related. New kind of definition we're going to make is for an upper triangular matrix. The matrix is upper triangular if it's only in the upper triangle here, in other words, on or above the diagonal, that you have non-zero entries. So in particular, all the entries below the diagonal are all zero. Okay, so, so such a matrix is called uh, upper triangular. Uh, likewise for lower triangular, a lower triangular matrix um, uh, just looks like the same, same thing except all zeros above the diagonal. Okay, so we'll talk about upper triangular matrices. So the theorem we have here is that if you have two matrices, both upper triangular, then the product is also upper triangular. So let me walk you through uh, this one as well. It's a very similar argument uh, to what we made above, so I'll go maybe a little bit more quickly through this one. Uh, let's try to understand the uh, this matrix one row at a time again. So we'll start by looking at the kth row. And again, that kth row is this linear combination of those rows. Right? That's how matrix multiplication works. And that's the point of view that we're going to take here anyway. Uh, don't forget, uh, these coefficients here come from the k row of this left matrix. Okay. All right, so what do we know? Uh, well, we know uh, in this kth row of this uh, of this left matrix, that because this matrix is upper triangular, uh, the first k minus one of those entries are zero. That's what it means to be all zeros below the diagonal. Right? If you look at a uh, look at the diagonal and uh, notice that in the diagonal, the first the first row there are no zeros to the left of the diagonal. In the second row, there's one zero to the left of the diagonal. In the third row, there's two zeros. It's always one less than the row index. Okay. All right, so we have k minus one, uh, what we're gonna go ahead and call leading zeros there. And per the previous uh, discussion, if the coefficient is zero, doesn't really matter what those zeros are being multiplied by. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, what's in those rows? Uh, specifically, these k minus one rows doesn't matter because they're all going to get multiplied by zero. Okay. Okay. So, what does matter? What is left? What is not? What does not disappear? Is these remaining rows here, excuse me, these remaining entries in that kth row, and they get multiplied by, why don't I do this a little bit more, there we go. They get multiplied by these rows. Right? We have coefficients in a linear combination of now these rows. Okay. So which rows are these? Well, uh, this is the kth entry through the last entry. That means that this is the kth row that it's getting multiplied by. And then, you know, further. Okay, well, how many leading zeros can we say that there are in that kth row? Well, being as it is the kth row of an upper triangular matrix, and let's not lose sight of the fact that this B is upper triangular. That matrix there is upper triangular. Um, there are K minus one leading zeros there, at least. And now, 
for the rows after that, there are at, at least that many as well. There are k minus 1 leading zeros in all of these rows. So what I've got then is a linear combination of rows, all of which, oh, whoops, uh, all of which um, have k minus 1 leading zeros. So that linear combination will have k minus 1 leading zeros. Let me label this. Uh, there are k minus 1 leading zeros. And therefore, that likewise has k minus 1 leading zeros. So altogether, what we have shown is that uh, this row uh, this row, this the kth row, has k minus 1 leading zeros, and that that's true for all values of k, and therefore this matrix is upper triangular. Okay, so you notice the argument is very similar to the analogous argument for diagonal matrices, a little bit different in the details, but it's the same idea. You understand matrix multiplication as a statement about linear combinations of rows, and then just count your zeros. Keep track of your zeros, basically. Okay, so moving along. Uh, another little idea that needs to get discussed this idea of a transpose of a matrix. We denote the transpose with this superscript of a capital T. It just says transpose. And the idea is, roughly speaking, let's go to the rough idea first, that you're going to take the diagonal of the matrix, even if it's not a square matrix, and just flip over the diagonal. So notice that when you flip over the diagonal, rows become columns. Right, just flipping over that sort of 45 degree uh, green line there. And uh, furthermore, columns become rows. Okay. Another way to say this is that if you're looking in the transpose matrix, what is the row number and column number, well, in the original matrix, that's the row number and the column number. So what had been the uh, row number becomes the column number. What had been the column number becomes the row number. You're just switching rows with columns. All right, so algebraically, we write it down like this, but you think of it uh, like this. Okay, it's a very odd, at first glance, seemingly odd little operation. I've taken a matrix and, uh, just, you know, uh, I mean, why flip over that line? Why not, uh, why not flip over um, that line or something? Uh, it just, it seems like an arbitrary choice. Um, but it is particularly interesting to notice that rows become columns. We know that rows and columns are natural things, and so turning one natural thing into a different natural thing, not arbitrary. This actually is a more natural process than at a glance it might appear. Okay, further evidence of that fact. Transposes have a really close connection to matrix multiplication. So in particular, the transpose of a product of two matrices is the product of the individual transposes. Well, that's pretty natural. Uh, now you do have to be careful. Don't forget uh, with this, uh, you'll notice here that the order switches. So the one that was on the left goes over to the right when you transpose it. And the one that was on the right goes over to the left when you transpose it. you got to switch, uh, just like with inverses. So let's see why this is true. Uh, this is a very direct brute force proof. I'm going to take this matrix and I'm going to write down what its ij entry is. And then I'm going to take this matrix and I'm going to write down what its ij entry is. And I'm just going to confirm that they are in fact the exact same thing. 
All right, so let's take these one at a time. Um, from our definition of transpose, if you're transposing, then the IJ entry becomes the JI entry. Okay. From one of our interpretations of matrix multiplication, when you multiply two matrices AB, you take the corresponding row of the left matrix, you take the corresponding column of the right matrix. Notice we're using capitals to indicate rows, lowercase to indicate columns, as we did when we were talking about matrix multiplication in the first place. And we have here then a formula for how to compute this IJ entry uh, of the matrix on the left side up here. Okay. Now what about on the right side? On the right side, well, we compute the IJ entry by, uh, again, if you know, you're multiplying two matrices, you take the i row of the left matrix, you take the j column of that right matrix, that's, a def that's one of our formulas for matrix multiplication. Don't forget that transposing trades rows with columns. And likewise, here, transposing trades columns and rows. So what we have then is the ith column of B dot the jth row of A, and in fact, then exactly the same thing that we got in the other. So this is a very direct brute force calculation uh, just using uh, facts that we already have at our disposal uh, to draw the desired conclusion. Okay. Okay. A consequence of this really lovely little fact. The transpose of an inverse is the inverse of the transpose. Very unexpected. This is, I, I would go so far as to call this shocking. Uh, let me try to explain first why I think this is a shocking fact. Um, our process for inverting a matrix, the process that we have so far, is a, oh gosh, it's a tedious and mysterious process. Right? We take, if you want to invert a matrix, A, uh, you write the identity next to it, and you row reduce, keep doing row operations, until you get the identity on the left, and then sort of borderline magically, you get A inverse on the right. Now, it's an immediate consequence of elementary matrices, for sure. Right? But it's a, uh, um, as a process, this is a uh, sort of cryptic, opaque process. Whereas, uh, this process for how do we transpose a matrix is super, super uh, evident. Uh, you flip it over the diagonal. Right? It's really easy to see what happens there. So it's just amazing to think that if you transpose a matrix, that the process of going through and inverting that transpose would always give you exactly the transpose of the inverse matrix. Uh, inverse matrix. It just seems surprising that that would work. Uh, anyway, very counterintuitive as a result, uh, but it's not hard to prove. It's an immediate consequence of, um, of what we just proved above here, this fact here. So if I want to prove that ma these two matrices are inverses of each other, the direct way to prove that two matrices are inverses of each other, you show that the one times uh, the other, uh, whoops, the other uh, is the identity. Right? That's how you show two matrices are the inverses of each other. A B is equal to A inverse if AB is the identity. That's all we're doing here, basically. Okay. So I'm going to multiply this out and see what we get. Well, this property tells us that the product of the transposes is the transpose of the product. There's A times A inverse is the identity. And the identity transpose is, of course, the identity. 
because the identity is um, all zeros of both above and below. And you just think about how it transposes, and nothing happens. Okay. So, uh, immediate proof to a very surprising theorem. Okay. Symmetric matrices. Quick definition a matrix is symmetric if it's equal to its own transpose. And it's just very easy to see the motivation for this term by this example. Look at that diagonal. Think about what happens when you flip this over the diagonal. That goes to that. Right? That goes to that. That goes to that. The matrix doesn't change when you flip it over the diagonal. So symmetric is a very natural choice of terminology um, uh, if, it's, if a matrix is equal to its own transpose. Okay. Um, all right, uh, you can write that down in general though, like this. That, uh, of course, when you transpose, the ij entry goes to the ji entry. Symmetric would mean that those are the same. Okay. Uh, curious little fact. For any matrix A, that product is symmetric. Unexpected. Now, this is true for any matrix. Very weird. I'll show you why. How do we check if a matrix is symmetric? Well, you check that a matrix is symmetric if that matrix is its own transpose. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take this matrix and we're going to check that that matrix is its own transpose. So in particular, I'm going to take that matrix and I'm going to transpose it and I'm going to confirm that you get itself back. Okay. Well, to get that result, again, we cite this old fact about transposes and multiplications. Uh, notice that that is that. That is that. So here I'm just asserting that the transpose of product is the product of the transposes. Don't forget to switch the order, of course. Um, the transpose of the transpose of a matrix. Not hard to see that that's the original matrix. You flip it and flip it back. Nothing happened. And as desired, the transpose of that matrix is itself, and that's the definition of symmetric. Okay, very similar argument to be made about this product uh, that is also symmetric. Here's the argument. I'll let you guys read that. Okay. All right, and then lastly, um, a consequence of this of, um, uh, of the previous theorem that we wrote down: uh, if you have an invertible symmetric matrix. The inverse is also symmetric. Now, again, that seems like a really surprising result. Uh, yeah, and just imagine, uh, you know, again, think about how we find inverses. Uh, if you have a, a nice uh, symmetric matrix here, so this is symmetric, right? Uh, well, yeah, but our process of inverting means we're going to go through and start doing a bunch of row operations and as we go through and do row operations very quickly we're going to get into uh, not symmetric stuff. All of these things, all of these sort of intermediate stage, you have no reason to believe that they're going to be symmetric. You're doing row operations. Row operations don't preserve any sort of symmetries. And this is easy to check by examples. Just pick a symmetric matrix and start row reducing it. It's going to immediately turn non-symmetric. And yet, what this theorem is saying is that once you get this down to the identity, assuming the matrix is invertible, of course, this matrix A inverse will again be symmetric. Even though it, the, the right-hand side went through a long phase of non-symmetric things. So it kind of comes out of nowhere. Again, very unexpected. Again, easy to prove. Uh, the way we check that a matrix is symmetric is to show that it's the transpose of the matrix is equal to itself. That's the definition of symmetric. So we're going to check that um, by first. 
citing that previous theorem from the previous page. That's that. Uh, don't forget, we know that A is symmetric. So A transpose is equal to A. Right. And sure enough, we have successfully shown now whoops, um, that the transpose of A inverse is equal to A inverse. So A inverse is its own transpose. That means that A is symmetric. Okay. Okay, there are several other uh, facts in the book. Uh, that are discussed uh, about uh, in the section on special matrices. Um, you should make a point of uh, reading through that section and uh, seeing all those facts. Uh, the ones I've discussed here are the ones I think are the most interesting and worthy of uh, discussion, but uh, make sure you read the rest for details.